Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, thanks again, Greg, for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan Nunamani. For those of you who I haven't met, I'm up at Virginia Mason in Seattle. And uh, I think you guys had a talk last week on PJK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so uh, we'll try to, no, my disclosures are relevant here. Um, so we will spend very little time on the definition of PJK. Well, I will go through just a little bit, so just to make sure we have that covered. Uh, in case you guys didn't get that last week. But uh, my disclaimer here for this this talk is that, unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I have plenty of cases with PJK and PJF. Um, and in my opinion, uh, unfortunately, we are not, we've not figured out how to completely prevent this yet in the year 2024, but um, hopefully we can uh, continue to work on how to try to reduce the risk of opportunities. Uh, PJK. <laughs> I think someone may need to mute their mic potentially. Um, so if we look at kind of the rates of PJK, you know, there's been some work done looking at how this has changed over the years. ISG has done done some work on this, and really there hasn't been any change uh, at all in the rates of PJK or PJA, PJF, despite a lot of research into this area um, and a lot of uh, additional prevention strategies and evolution in terms of our understanding of alignment. And so unfortunately, this continues to be kind of a vexing problem. So for this talk, we're going to go through uh, briefly some definitions, uh, talk about what are the risk factors uh, that, that we know of, at least uh, for PJK and PJF, uh, both modifiable risk factors as well as non-modifiable risk factors, as well as then go through strategies uh, that, you know, some of the evidence for the strategies to try to reduce this, these risks. And we'll go through kind of preoperative, intraoperative, and some postoperative strategies as well. So just to go through some definitions, again, PJK is a uh, sagittal angle at least uh, greater than 10 degrees or uh, 10 degrees greater than what the preoperative measurement was. It can be benign or it can be symptomatic. Failure is really probably the more clinically relevant uh, definition. And this is where this is a PJK that requires revision surgery or PJK uh, with a fracture of the UIB, um, a frank disruption of the osteoligamentous complex or, or instrumentation pullout. And I think the important thing to know is that there really is a spectrum of PJK and PJF uh, from those cases where it's very, very benign um, and, and noticed primarily on the radiographs only to those where you have uh, a frank, you know, fracture dislocation with a neurologic deficit. And these are the ones certainly that we want to all avoid. Thankfully, those are much less common than the instances of radiographic PJK. There are some classification systems that have been developed. Uh, Mitsuru Yagi uh, from Tokyo uh, wrote this one with Dr. Bowachi back about oh, over a decade ago. And they basically look at uh, greater from type one to three with the disc or ligamentous failure being a type one and then a bony failure being a type two or three. I think the pertinent part here is that um, uh, lower thoracic UIV uh, constructs such as, a, let's say it's called a T10 to pelvis, those tend more commonly to fail by a bony failure, whereas your upper thoracic UIV constructs most commonly tend to fail by a ligamentous failure, although the, that's certainly not uh, always the case for, for either of those. Um, and then they came up with the grading system in terms of the angle, and then the presence or absence of a spondylolisthesis above the UIV. ISSG came up with a scale as well. Uh, Bob Hart led this work uh, uh, basically looking at other characteristics that can be associated with PJK, such as pain, neurologic deficit, um, uh, and then you know whether or not there was a fracture or a ligamentous disruption that occurred along with the uh, the PJK. Now, why do we care about this? Uh, PJK patients have worse overall outcomes, even in those cases where it's it's not a junctional failure. So PJK patients have more back pain compared to patients without PJK, and this makes sense uh, because they're not only, you know, have either a fracture or a ligamentous issue, but they uh, are really developing a new deformity at that, that location. Um, and whether or not they, and, and this is true, whether or not they required revision surgery, that these patients just generally uh, were not doing as well as those patients without, surgery, without PJK. And so this is a clinically relevant uh, uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> now, if we look at the risk factors for PJK, I kind of uh, grouped them into this, uh, this sort of criteria, and this has been uh, uh, shown before as a, this is kind of a way to think about it, really. And I've kind of highlighted some of these and classified them into modifiable, non-modifiable, and possibly modifiable. Uh, the obvious ones that are non-modifiable are things like the patient's age or how bad their deformity is ahead of time. And the things that are obviously modifiable are things like, you know, what are 
choice of UIV is and you know how much we dissect the spine, whether we're going to, down to the pelvis or not, how long our construct is, uh, and even things like osteoporosis. I have put a couple of these things into a possibly modifiable category, which most people probably will put into modifiable. And this, and the ones I put into there are the combined anterior posterior procedures and the magnitude of the correction. And the reason why I put those into the possibly modifiable uh, context is that I think when a lot of these papers were, were written, you know, let's say seven, 10 years ago, um, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, do we, do we, uh, undercorrect these patients, you know, to try to reduce the risk of PJK or do we try to achieve age adjusted sagittal alignment? And, um, I'll talk a little bit about why I don't think that's the right thing to do. So if we start first with the preoperative optimization of these patients, this all starts way before surgery, right? And this essentially uh, amounts to trying to pick candidates that are that are reasonable patients to have an operation. So um, the most frail patients, the patients with um, that are smokers, the patients that have, you know, a T-score of minus 4.0, uh, you know, BMI of, of 46, you know, these are these are the kind of patients that you want to try to um, to optimize these patients prior to uh, doing an operation. And these are just kind of the obvious things that I think all of us do, right? And so don't operate on smokers, don't operate on patients over the BMI of 35 or 40, make sure patients are nutritionally uh, teed up, whatever prehabilitation your, your, your team might do, make sure you do that. And these are all things that are, I think, important just as a baseline to try to reduce the rates of PJK. Bone health is one thing I want to focus on, uh, particularly because I think this is one of those um, easily modifiable risk factors. Uh, we know that osteoporosis treatment decreases PJK risk, and um, and specifically, the medications that seem to help are the anabolic agents. There are now three different anabolic agents that are available to treat bone density, and these are teriparatide, also called Forteo, um, abaloparatide, also called Timlos, and Romozosumab, which is also called Abenity. And because teriparatide has been around the longest, that's primarily where most of the data is available. But uh, uh, teriparatide has been shown to increase the house flow units um, uh, and actually out of proportion to the increase in the DEXA scan. And so this is uh, something that primary care doctors often will do is that they'll, they'll treat someone for osteoporosis, they'll get a repeat. Um, DEXA scan say, well, there's no, there's no difference. But I think it's important to note that some of the improvements in bone density um, can only be detected using a CT scan. Now, many of us often don't usually do that. I, I actually don't get a repeat CAT scan if I'm, if I'm treating someone for osteoporosis. And, and the reason is that these medicines also uh, will help increase your bone quality, which is death, which is a, basically a change in the microarchitecture of the uh, of the bone. I believe Brandon Carlson gave you guys a really nice talk kind of describing the differences between, you know, or the difference between bone density and bone quality. Uh, and so these medicines uh, really can lead to an improvement in the bone that's not characterized or not detected by DEXA changes or house view unit changes. But these medicines definitely work. Um, uh, Mitsuru Yagi uh, published a paper looking at PJK rates. These are kind of bony failures and, and showed that um, uh, teriparatide use decreased the rate of PJK uh, in the in, in a group of patients that received teriparatide versus those that didn't. So these medicines definitely work to optimize uh, those patients who have poor bone health. We can also assess the bone density uh, at particular levels. This is something that people have started to do, and I, I, I definitely do, uh, in terms of selecting your UIV for surgery. Um, ben Elder at Mayo Clinic uh, looked at uh, PJK rates in patients uh, where he risk stratified patients based on the the houseful units and showed uh, for the upper thoracic spine um, that the houseful units, if you had a cutoff of less than one, we'll just call it 150, PGK was upwards of 60, you know, 50 to 50 to 60 percent. Whereas if the houseful units were close to 200, the PGK rate was only 7 percent. Now the important thing about this is that this is, these are different numbers that were pre previously published uh, for the lower thoracic spine which kind of makes sense if you think about it, the upper thoracic vertebrae are smaller, they're more cortical, less cancellous bone. And so the household units are necessarily higher. So if you pick a, a level that's 120, you know, and at T4, that might be an okay household unit for um, T10, but not necessarily for T4. So just mm -hmm. be mindful of that, that there are different cutoffs in different regions of the spine. <clears throat> So my tip number one, just to kind of if you uh, if the, the fellows listening, you know, only 
listen for a particular size, look for these slides. Uh, these are kind of the, the, the tips. So make sure you optimize patients before surgery with a special focus on their bone health. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about alignment. Um, I'm not going to delve into this because this is uh, certainly uh, a talk in and of itself. Um, but the, the goal should be to try to achieve normal post-operative alignment in these patients. Um, <clears throat> there are all sorts of papers, um, you know, over the past decade looking at different alignment targets and um, several, several um, authors suggesting that we should shoot for an age-adjusted alignment, especially in patients with poor bone health. The problem with that is that, um, you know, when you don't fix someone to normal alignment, they're having to engage a lot of their compensatory mechanisms to try to maintain standing alignment. And there have been finite element analyses done, uh, which have showed that as patients involve more compensatory mechanisms to stand, that actually increases the forces on the, the fusion construct, both on the screw, screw bone interface, as well as the UIV um, normal bone junction. The gap papers showed that older patients are actually less tolerant of malalignment. You get a point actually for being older. And so these patients have a higher mechanical complication risk. And so getting normal alignment in these patients is really important. Um, I know because you, you guys are training with Greg and Bob and, and Hanny, they, they are believers in, uh, you know, this, this, uh, in, in this, um, the T4 L1 hip axis, you know, using T4 PA and L1 PA, uh, which really allows for a quantification of, of Rusli types. Um, and allows you to uh, essentially take your pelvic incidence and, and figure out what sort of alignment you need based on based on a spectrum of PIs. Um, I'm a big believer in using planning software to try to help make sur surgery more reproducible. And so uh, you can do things like this, where you can essentially put um, you know your your um, uh, preoperative images into a plan and essentially try to recreate the plan and and measure out exactly what you want to get in terms of your correction, and then. Um, here I'm a little, I was a little off on my T4PA, but uh, pretty, pretty darn close to achieving my, um, my, my, my goals. So uh, prevention tip number two is get the alignment as perfect as you can. Don't just eyeball it, actually measure the numbers and try to hit those targets. So if you aim for perfect, then you're gonna get pretty darn close. As far as intraoperative strategies, um, you know, uh, we'll start first with exposure. So uh, there have been several papers, you know, kind of starting with the old uh, biomechanics studies by Punjabi, uh, which showed the role of the posterior ligamentous complex in preventing motion between the, the bacterial bodies. Uh, and they showed that if you section the supraspinous ligament and the intraspinous ligament, this resulted in a loss of, um, of flexion stiffness. And then if you actually dissected the muscles even more, that resulted in even more uh, loss of flexion stiffness. And so um, this is something I know you guys have, have learned before, but try to limit your dissection as much as possible. Certainly not, you know, multiple levels above the instrumented area if you can. Uh, and, and what I do is I will maintain the midline structures, uh, meaning the supraspinous ligaments and intraspinous ligaments for at least two to three levels adjacent to the UIV. What you guys have probably noticed is that as you dissect proximally, especially in the upper thoracic spine, that tissue can get pretty thin. And so if you're not careful before you know it without trying, you can all of a sudden disrupt the inner spine segment and super spine segment. And so I'll usually leave a pretty wide cuff, uh, especially at the proximal junction as I dissect down and really try to tr try to maintain that. I think it's really important, however, uh, and I always tell our own fellow this, that make sure you expose well enough to place your instrumentation accurately. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is, is be so, uh, be so careful in trying to limit your exposure that you actually can't see well enough to place your screws pro uh, uh, properly. And this goes for whether you're doing, you know, placing your screws freehand or, or using nav or using a robot, because if you're really yorking on the proximal soft tissues, then uh, your nav is going to be off of using nav, your robot arm is not going to dock properly and, and you're not going to be able to see your landmarks for freehand screw placement. I think the other thing that can happen too is if you limit your proximal dissection, you end up aiming up more than you think. And so rather than placing straight ahead or anatomic trajectory screw, your screw ends up in the disc space. And that's probably the worst possible thing you could do for protecting your junction. As far as UIV fixation, um, uh, you know, there's a, I think an ongoing debate uh, whether, whether hooks versus screws uh, make a difference in terms of PJK risks. Um, there's a, a paper by Tharwani you know, that showed that he used a porcine model actually that showed that um, in a, if you use a, a, a TP hook uh, construct that the transition was more gradual. And this doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously screws are a more rigid type of fixation, 
Um, and, and what they showed in this paper was that you essentially had more motion <clears throat> in the proximal instrumented segments when you use transverse process hooks. Uh, so that transition to the non-instrument portion of the spine was more gradual. Um, there hasn't been any great data that I've seen, uh, um, <clears throat> although I certainly could have missed it, looking at the effect of, of fusion, effect of this on fusion rates, obviously we think that rigid fixation will increase our ability to obtain a solid fusion. Uh, and so I think this still needs to be worked out. Um, uh, the Hopkins group uh, published a paper back in 2013 looking at um, using hooks versus screws with UIV, and they had essentially no PJK in their hook group and uh, you know a third of the group having PJK in their screw group. Now, this has not really been replicated in other groups, but it's something to consider. This kind of goes along with really looking at the stiffness of the transition of the spine, basically going from the uninstrumented to the instrumented portion. And so another thing that people do are, are using tethers. So the problem with this is the data is kind of all over the place. Um, you know, there are various mechanisms for how you tether. I've showed a couple schemes. This middle picture is, is a case that I did just a few weeks ago where uh, we couldn't find the, because there are actually these tethering um, systems now, but the, the rep couldn't find the tethering system. And so for a high risk case, I kind of took a tether and tied it to a cross link and then distracted on the cross link to tension the tether. So the techniques are all over the place. I think this is something that still needs to be worked out whether or not um, tethering makes any difference at all. People have also looked at using percutaneous fixa fixation at the upper instrument vertebra. Um, uh, Praveen Muminani looked at the PJK rates with percutaneous instrumentation compared to a hybrid group. And this was kind of lateral, lateral deformity. These are, I think, smaller um, or less severe deformities and really showed no difference in the perk group versus those with an open posterior group. Uh, Larry Lenke published this, what he calls the Hamza approach. I don't think he actually does this anymore, but basically where, you know, he places the upper screws through a, um, uh, yeah, through a kind of an intramuscular plane uh, to try to preserve the musculature at the, at the upper part of a construct as well. So data is still out regarding this, but kind of goes along with the, the idea of trying to preserve the proximal soft tissues as much as you can. Other things people have done for PJK prevention, prevention try to limit the bony failure is cement augmentation of UIV. Uh, this is something that uh, I think makes makes some sense. There are um, uh, several authors that have published on looking at vertebroplasty. Again, the Hopkins group did this and they showed a, in, at the two year time point that those who underwent vertebroplasty at the UIV and UIV plus one had a lower PJ F and PJK rate than the has been the literature reported uh, uh, data. There was really no uh, no internal control there, but when they looked at this five years out, the rates were basically the same. So I think that uh, this is still out for debate. What I do, you know, my my tips for this is I will consider tethering and cementing in in very high risk cases uh, because of what I mentioned earlier that the lower thoracic UIV cases are the ones that tend to fail by, uh, usually by bony failure. To me, cementing makes more sense in those cases, uh, and tethering makes more sense in the upper cases where the failure rates more ligamentous. Um, it's important to note that cement will often end up, especially in the upper, if you cement the upper thoracic vertebrae, it'll often, uh, end up in the lungs and in the heart if you get a post-op CT scan. So if you are scanning patients post-op, just be aware your radiologist will call you, uh, and you don't need very much cement. For, for it to wind up in places where you don't mean for it to end up. As far as for strategies, not really much up there. I found this one paper looking at bracing, really no effect on, on bracing, uh, no effect of bracing on PJK rates. So what I currently do is uh, I rigorously preoperatively optimize these patients, you know, all these factors that, that I talked about, uh, especially treating bone health uh, if, if patients are osteoporotic meticulous exposure, try to get the alignment corrected as much as normal. I kind of go back and forth on hooks versus screws. I'm currently now based on a PJK after using screws, now back to hooks again, my upper thoracic, um, upper thoracic cases at T10, I'm always, or the lower thoracic spine, I'm still always stopping with screws. I do at least consider tethering or cement in high risk cases. And occasionally I will actually put patients in an Aspen collar for upper thoracic UIV. Uh, if they're if they're a high risk case, uh, the idea of this is that if you prevent them from looking down, theoretically that's at least decreasing some of those forces on that um, UIV uh, proximal thoracic spine junction. 
Just to end on a case example, and we'll have time, have time for a few questions. So this is a patient that was actually sent to me like this uh, who had suffered PJK. Um, and so it's a 72 year old female with the osteoporosis that was diagnosed after her surgery because she never had any sort of bone density workup prior to her operation. Um, and so she basically, before, the left, before, before she left the hospital, her x-rays looked like this. Uh, she had a history of, um, of, of psoriasis and osteoporosis that was diagnosed, as I said, after her operation. Uh, she was a low BMI patient. Um, she was neurologically intact and, and compensating significantly to maintain this posture. These are numbers, low PI, uh, she had 35 degrees of lordosis from L1 to L4 and 32 degrees of lordosis from L4 to S1 for a um, overall lordosis of 65 for a PI 43. She had a negative L1 PA uh, and a very high pelvic tilt for that pelvic incidence. Uh, not really much correction in the supine position. You can see on her CT scan that she had a fracture of her upper instrumental vertebra with both pedicles uh, being disrupted at that junction. No, no spinal cord compression on a CT myelogram. And so, so this, you know, obviously a high risk PJK case. And in, in, her, in her case, uh, her reasons for PJK I, that I think were present were diagnosis of osteoporosis and then poor alignment in the initial operation. And so what we did was I treated her because she was neurologically intact. I didn't take her to surgery right away, I optimized her. So we treated her with romozosumab for three months prior to surgery. Uh, and then I did a, a, a T4 to pelvis revision where I did a, a VCR at the junction and uh, got that normalized. And then I actually did a reverse osteotomy at the open, only open disc space that she had in the lumbar spine, which is at the L3-4 level. And we kind of used these, these fibular struts to maintain a kyphotic correction to get that part of the spine to um, uh, back into kyphosis and to to put her where it need, needed to be um, and, and to maintain that. And so this are, these are her final final standing films. This is at six, month, six months post-op, I believe. Uh, not really sure why she's still standing with elevated pelvic tilt, but um, hopefully that will, that will correct over time. So I'll stop here um, and, uh, and I'll take any, any questions that people have. Thanks, Venu. That's great, man. Yeah, awesome, bud. Thank so you. anything that, uh, I guess I'll start off with a question. So anything that you guys do um, that I don't do or I didn't mention for PJK prevention? Uh, I'll let the fellows stay if they want. Crickets. <laughs> uh, no, pretty much salt, salt, salt. I got I got rid of bracing maybe five years ago. Let's yeah. just stop bracing people. Um, I, I don't think that was very effective. Um, but yeah, I think you. I think the pre-op thing is huge. I I I mean, I love the whole T four L one PA, but it's not. I mean, like even look at this case, right? Something's not totally right, and that's where mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're accounting for some of the soft tissues in the in the mix of it. So I think there's a soft tissue and neurologic element that we have to, you know, somehow figure out, you know, if someone has an L5 or dick with bad gluteal function, right? Their posterior chain is disrupted. And then like, they're not going to stand normal because of that, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, it's, it's those pieces I think that are still a bit elusive to us. Um, I think for where we are in 2024, we can basically just about only be, re be responsible for you know, like what you did, like our alignment and trying to get that spot on. But I I don't know if beyond that we can, you know, take on the responsibility out of the soft tissues and, you know, things yeah, like 100, that. Yeah, 100%. You know, I mean, I, I only mentioned the bone aspect. I know you and uh, Dr. Shahidi are, you know, doing some ligament biomechanics and, and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, some very, very good work trying to understand that more. So, you know, all the, the ligament you know, biology, we don't understand the the muscle biology, you know, in terms of sarcopenia and just more subtle muscle dysfunction, we don't understand. And so absolutely, I think that stuff um, uh, still needs to be worked out. But it's kind of crazy, right, that we still kind of suck at this. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did um, not I get the, the, other thing. the case I was going to the case I was going to put up. I mean, to, to your point, right, it's like, you know, I have, I have several cases where I've gotten the the L1, you know, T4 L1 PA perfect, and they still PJK, right? Yeah. And so, so I don't. Uh, this is like you said, it's not the 
end all be all. We, we don't understand this very well yet. Well, I mean, yeah, and if you look at, you know, the data from that study, you know, the you're getting the risk down to 5%, right? It's not zero. That's still one in 20. Right. Yeah. We somehow think one in 20 is good, uh, yeah. right? Like that's, that's pretty insane. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, awesome. Any, uh, any other questions for Benu while we have him? Yeah, hey, this is David, one of the fellows here. Um, I guess one question I had, uh, uh, one of the things we do is we, we do, we have them do at least three months of the biologics treatments, um, the anabolics prior to surgery, if they have the DEXA and the osteoporotic category. Um, do you have a treatment goal or do you check uh, anything after a certain amount of treatment before you let them sign up or how's your um, pre-op workflow for that? Yeah, so I don't, um, I kind of have a, a sliding scale, honestly, you know, and it also depends what medication you're using. So uh, romazosumab tends to work faster. Uh, there's a little bit of clinical data as well as some basic science data that supports uh, th that, um, that, th that that medicine actually works a little bit quicker. And so usually I'll do three months of romazosumab if it's Forteo that I'm using and it's, um, uh, or, 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 or Timlos, those basically work by, by the same pathway. Uh, that one I'm I'm going to go usually a minimum of six months because uh, it takes a little bit longer to do to do its work, and then if uh, it also depends on the patient's uh, uh, bone density. You know, if they're very very high risk, multiple prior fractures, I'll Thank often treat them for longer um, rather than uh, you know I might treat them for a year, for example. The important thing to remember is that the medicines can also be used for different lengths of time. So romazosumab is is a year basically you have that medication, whereas Forteo or Timlos are two years. And so for romazosum, you know, if you're doing three months ahead of time, you have nine months afterwards to treat them. And I think that kind of maintaining, um, uh, you know, you have being able to use that medication after surgery is almost as important as before surgery, you know, try to prevent, um, uh, try to stimulate the, the bone formation pathway and get them to get them to heal. So yeah, it's really a sliding scale for me. And then for obesity stuff, are you guys seeing any luck with uh, new medical management treatments or have any other tips on how to motivate people? Do you just give them a hard cut off and tell them to call you when they get there or how do you kind of approach that? Yeah, it's a great question. That's really hard. You know, <clears throat> I think I, I, I try to tell people, you know, because inevitably what people will tell you if someone comes in with a BMI of 45, you know, and, and, and you tell them, hey, look, like you need to lose weight. You know, our cutoff in our system is 40. Um, we, and, you know, in many centers is 35. Um, you know, if you just tell them, hey, you need to lose weight, they'll tell you, well, I, but I can't exercise with my spine like this. So how am I supposed to lose weight? You know, I think it's the one thing that I do tell them um, is, is that really, you know, if you drink a can of soda, like a regular can of Coke, that's the equivalent of going on like a three mile run in terms of calorie, calories, not a walk, a run. So, so it's impossible to exercise your way to weight loss. So I, at least just, I, I said that that's kind of the only spiel that I give in clinic. Um, but we actually have a pretty good weight loss center. And so I'll put in a referral for people to, to see our comprehensive weight loss clinic. And then they'll talk to them about the medical treatments and surgical treatments. Um, we have had reasonable success with people. I think people that live in, um, you know, probably it's called a hundred mile radius of us. I think we do pretty well on cause we can bring them to, to our place, uh, to, to work on weight loss. The people that are really geographically remote, I think we have a harder time with, cause they're not going to travel to our center. And, and sometimes they're from medical de deserts where there's no, no resources, you know, for, for any of this stuff. So, um, those are, those patients are harder. Well, thanks Benu. Thanks for being here. Um, so all right. Everyone have a great week and uh, we'll see you out there somewhere, Benu, I'm sure. <laughs> all right. Sounds all right. good, guys. Bye. All right. Thanks. All right. Take care, guys. All, all right. right. See you later, guys. Bye.